we can decompose the original problem in smaller instances of itself. Why do we need it? Because there are certain type of problems that cannot be solved through iteration without additional data structures. For instance, one such motivating problem is let's try to find all the files under a certain directory that contain a particular word. However, we know that directories may contain subdirectories, those subdirectories may contain other subdirectories and so on. So, for instance, if we have our workspace, and this is workspace Java, and we are looking for any file that contains triangle. It could be at the level of the root directory, or it could be at the level of the subdirectories, or it could be in sources, which is a subdirectory to a subdirectory of the directory in which we are looking for that file. So the directories contain subdirectories, and this may go for a very de deep uh, search. In fact, we cannot really uh, make a finite search. We can't say that go up to level 100 or up to level 10, because there may be subdirectories of the directories at level 10 or 100. So the solution is to use recursion by searching the files in the subdirectories recursively. I just wanted to modify it. So there are other problems, some also from artificial intelligence. You may have heard recently uh, there was a game of Go that the computer played better than the human champions. There are other games that in the past uh, the uh, computers were better than humans, like for instance in chess. Uh, there are also other games that are not yet solved, like for instance poker or shogi. The computers cannot yet play as well as human champions. So the one problem in artificial intelligence is how to place a number of queens on a chessboard such that no two queens attack each other. This is the eight queens problem for uh, a chessboard of 8x8. Eight eight. But the problem can be also extended to any size uh, uh, chessboard. So this problem is easier to solve through a methodology called divide and conquer. And that methodology says, try to place seven queens and then place the last eight queen such that it doesn't attack the previously placed seven queens. Now, how to place seven queens? The same idea applies. Try to place six queens and then place the seventh queen in such a way that uh, it doesn't attack the previous six queens. So this is a recursive problem, because up to the last queen, which you basically can place anywhere on the chessboard, every single problem decomposes into n minus 1 queens, and then place the last queen. That is a recursive problem. We basically say that in order to place n queens, we need to place n minus 1, a recursive a, a smaller problem, but of the same type, and then put the last queen. So this is the classical definition of recursion. Now, another example of recursion that comes from number theory is computing factorial. Factorial is the product of the first n integers. n factorial is 1 multiplied with 2 multiplied with 3, and so on, up to multiply with n minus 1 multiplied with n. But if we are looking at the product of the first n minus 1 uh, operands or factors, we see that n, fa n minus 1 factorial is that product, is 1 multiplied with 2 multiplied with 3 up to n minus 1. So we can actually write n factorial as n multiplied with n minus 1 factorial. Now we have a recursive formula. This is a recursive relation. We define n factorial as an operation of n minus 1 factorial, and then followed by a constant operation, multiplication. So we can write the function factorial recursively as, first we have the base case, factorial of 0 is equal with 1, and then factorial of n for any n greater than equal with 1 is equal with n multiplied with factorial of n minus 1. 
So this is basically a solution that this applies for all n greater than 0. So this is the recursive case. The first one is the base case and the second is the recursive case. That second formula is called the rec uh, recursive relation. The first formula for n equals 0 is called the base case. Now, in Java, we would implement it like this. First, we would have a main method, which asks the user to enter a non-negative integer. We can read that integer. We can also check that the number that was entered is greater than 0, but as long or greater than, uh, greater than equal with 0. But as long as that number input is correct, we can invoke the method factorial of n. And the method factorial of n takes an integer n as a parameter, returns an integer. If n is equal with 0, which is the base case, we return 1. Otherwise, we return n multiplied with factorial of n minus 1. So now this is a recursive call. We see that we are calling the current method, but with a different parameter. Now, it's actually quite interesting because when we try to execute it with the debugger, we'll see that it executes as follows. Factorial of 3 will call factorial of 2. It's factorial of 3 since 3 is greater than uh, 0, is different than 0. It calls factorial of 2 and then computes 3 multiplied with factorial of 2. But now factorial of 2 is 2 multiplied with factorial of 1. And factorial of 1, since it's not yet the base case, is 1 multiplied with factorial of 0. Finally, factorial of 0 returns 1. And on the way back, as we return from the return statement of all of these methods, we multiply 1 with 1, and that's equal with 1, 1 with 2, and that is equal with 2, and finally 2 with 3, and that is equal with 6. And if we build how the call graph, how all of these called each other, we see that Factorial of 4 called factorial of 3, which called factorial of 2, which called factorial of 1, which called factorial of 0. All of these are frames on the stack. So we see the main method called factorial of 4, which called factorial of 3, which called factorial of 2, which called factorial of 1, which calls factorial of 0, which returns 1. We pop the frame from factorial of 0. Now we multiply 1 with 1 is 2. It's 1. We return 1 from factorial of 1. We pop from that stack of the execution stack. We pop the space required by factorial of 1. We return from factorial of 2, 2 multiplied with 1, which is 2. We pop the frame for factorial of 2. And we continue this process until we return to the main method and we return 24. So the stack was basically evolved. It started with just the space required for factorial of 4, but then it added the space for factorial of 3, factorial of 2, factorial of 1, factorial of 0, and then it started popping out the factorial of 0, factorial of 1, factorial of 2, and factorial of 3, and factorial of 4. In fact, the, main, the, the moment that it gets to the main method, the stack only contains the frame for the main method, nothing else. Before we continue with Fibonacci numbers, do you have any questions? Good. So if there are no questions, let's continue. Now, Fibonacci sequence is another standard classical uh, recursive problem. It started in the 12th century. There was a mathematician named Leonardo di Pisa, also Fibonacci. And uh, he basically wanted to prove that he could become rich if uh, he starts uh, raising rabbits. With the one pair of rabbits, he proved to his wife that uh, at the end of the year he would have around 200 rabbits. They would be very rich. Now, that 
it, it, the series executes exactly the way that he pro uh, he, he showed. But uh, from history, we know that he died in a poor house, so maybe his mathematical skills were not uh, good in economy. But we can actually see this problem here. So Fibonacci of zero is equal with zero. Fibonacci of one is equal with one. And then we have the recursive relation that defines the Fibonacci of some index is the sum of the Fibonacci of index minus 1 plus Fibonacci of index minus 2 for any index greater than or equal with 2. So if we apply this formula, Fibonacci of 3 is Fibonacci of 2 plus Fibonacci of 1. Fibonacci of 2 is Fibonacci of 1 plus Fibonacci of 0. We apply the recursive formula because it's not, 2 is not yet the base case. And now we can return for each one of these Fibonacci numbers, uh, functions, the base case. Fibonacci of 1 is 1, Fibonacci of 0 is 0, 1 plus 0 is 1, and 1 plus Fibonacci of 1 is 1 plus 1, which is 2. So Fibonacci of 3 is equal with 2. And if we apply the same system, Fibonacci of 4 will be Fibonacci of 3 plus Fibonacci of 2, which is 1 plus 2 is 3. Fibonacci of 5 is Fibonacci of 4 plus Fibonacci of 3. 2 plus 3 is 5. And the process goes on. Next Fibonacci number is 3 plus 5 is 8. Next Fibonacci number is 5 plus 8 is 13. Next Fibonacci number is 8 plus 13 is 21. The next Fibonacci number is 21, uh, 21 plus 13 is 34. And so on. It grows very fast. Fibonacci of 11 is 89. The next Fibonacci number is 55 plus 89, which is 144. And the process goes on. So how can we write in Java such a method? Here we have a, a, an example where we have the main method that asks the user for en to enter the index of a Fibonacci number. We read that index as an integer, and then we invoke the method Fibonacci of index. So Fibonacci takes a long index value, returns a long value. If that index is equal with 0, returns 1. If that index is equal with 1, it returns 1. Otherwise, it returns Fibonacci of index minus 1 plus Fibonacci of index minus 2. So these are the recursive calls. So we broke the problem into two smaller problems, which eventually they will converge to the base cases of 0 and 1. Now, if we look in the debug uh, and we trace this program line, line by line, we will see that Fibonacci of 4 returns Fibonacci of 3 plus Fibonacci of 2. Fibonacci of 3 calls Fibonacci of 2 and Fibonacci of 1. Fibonacci of 2 calls Fibonacci of 1 and Fibonacci of 0. Then it returns the sum of those two, which returns the sum, and so on. Fibonacci of 2 calls Fibonacci of 1 and Fibonacci of 0, and so on. But the problem is that certain calls are made a lot of times. Like, for instance, we compute twice Fibonacci of 2. Fibonacci of 2 is computed here, and Fibonacci of 2 is computed here. Why don't we just use the value that was computed in the previous invocation of that? If this is a function, it's a mathematical function with the same input, it should return the same output. With the same value in the domain, it should return the same value in the codomain. It's a function. So, in fact, what we could do is to simplify this execution by tabling or memoizing or remembering or caching, these are all actually terms used in computer science, for storing the result for that invocation of the function instead of recomputing it. So for no repeating comp computation, we can rewrite Fibonacci. First, again, we read the index for the Fibonacci series that we want to read. We use a static long var variable f which is an array of long values. F is a new long index plus 1, which is basically an array of long values. And we invoke the Fibonacci of that index. So now the Fibonacci series, 
the Fibonacci function takes the index. If the index is 0 or 1, it returns 0 or 1, but it also sets that f of 1 is equal with 1. Next, if f of index is different than 0, that basically means I already computed it before, then I return f of index. So I don't compute again the Fibonacci for some index if I already computed it and is different than 0. Otherwise, I compute it, f of the index is equal to Fibonacci of index minus 1 plus Fibonacci of index minus 2, and I return f of index. So basically what I'm doing, I'm saving the value of Fibonacci of that index in the array of uh, Fibonacci numbers before I return it. So next time I call for the same index, let's say 2 in the case of Fibonacci of 3, if we started with Fibonacci of 3, first time I call it, I compute Fibonacci of 2, but second time I call Fibonacci of 2, it actually returns the value that was pre-computed. So this whole tree that I have here under Fibonacci of 2 gets eliminated. I just return a value that was computed when we computed Fibonacci of 2 right here. There is no point to recompute Fibonacci of 2 here if I already know its value. So this is a methodology called tabling, dynamic programming, uh, it's very common in algorithms to store results that I already computed, so I don't recompute them every single time. Any, any questions? Okay. We are going to do three examples of uh, uh, recursion as part of the lab today. And if we have time, which I think we do have today, I'm also going to go over the homework for next Thursday, which also involves problems of recursion. So we are going to actually do more recursion in a few minutes. Some of them could actually use this tabling idea, saving results so we don't recompute them again and again. It's very common for mathematical sequences to store results instead of recomputing them through recursion. So what are the characteristics of recursion? First of all, all recursive methods have two parts. One is the base cases. We have one or more base cases that just are used to stop the recursion and return a value. Like the case in Fibonacci, we have two base cases. For the index is equal with 0, we return 0. For the index is equal with 1, we return 1. So the base case is, is when we don't call recursively the same method again. And then we have the recursive relation where we reduce the problem, the original problem, to a smaller uh, version of itself. So every recursive call in the recursive case reduces the original call, bringing it closer to the base case. In general, to solve a problem using recursion, we broke it into subproblems. If the subproblem resembles the original problem, then it's basically the recurs recursive solution. Apply the same method that we are currently implementing on that subproblem, uh, sub on the smaller uh, version of itself. The subproblem is almost the same size with the original. It's not always the case. Sometimes it's half. When we do, for instance, sorting or binary search, the subproblem is almost the same size of the original, but of a smaller size, closer to the base case. So let's actually try to solve several problems using recursion. Some of them, we saw them before, like for instance, the ones that uh, are from a race of stol uh, selection sort, we can do it recursively and binary search, we can do it recursively. Some of them are relatively newer problems, like for instance, print the message and times. We break the problem into two subproblems: print the message once, and then print the message and minus one times. This problem is almost the same with the original problem, but for a smaller size, n minus one. The base case is for from any, when n is equal with zero. 
if n is equal to 0, we exit. We don't do anything. So in this case, println takes a string message and an integer times. If times is greater than or equal to 1, we print the message once, system.out.println message, and then we invoke and print ln the message times minus 1. So we basically decrement the number of times because we already printed it once. Let's actually solve everything that we did up to now in Eclipse. We actually can see what's happening in each one of the cases. So I'm going to start with factorial, the first problem that we solved using recursion. So we create a new class, let's call it factorial. The class factorial contains a method factorial. This is a static method because we are getting all the parameters as parameter arguments to this method factorial. It takes an integer n. If n is equal to 0, we return the default value for factorial of 0, which is 1. Else, we return n multiplied with factorial of n minus 1. Now from the main method, we print out, let's say that we want factorial of 10. So what happens is that factorial of 10 calls factorial of 9, which calls factorial of 8, which calls factorial of 7, and so on, up to factorial of 0, which returns 1, and on the way back we return two multiply, 1 multiplied with 1, then 2 multiplied with 1, then two multiply, 3 multiplied with factor, factorial of 2, which is 2, and so on, and on the way back it basically computes factorials for all the factorials between factorial of 10 and factorial of 0. The second problem that we discussed was the Fibonacci numbers. And again, we are going to implement a method Fibonacci. Again, a static method. of some integer index. If the index is 0 or the index is 1, we can return the index 0 for 0 and 1 for 1. Else we return Fibonacci of index minus 1 plus Fibonacci of index minus 2. So in the main method, if we want, for instance, give me the value of Fibonacci of 20, it calls Fibonacci of 19 plus Fibonacci of 18, Fibonacci of 19 calls Fibonacci of 18 plus Fibonacci of 17 and so on. Now if we want to table this, we can modify it, we can define an integer array f, and before we invoke Fibonacci of 20, we can define this integer array f to be an integer array of 21 elements. Now, if the value is known, if f of index 
is different than zero, we can return it directly. Else, we are going to do two things. First, we need to compute it. f of index is Fibonacci of index minus 1 plus Fibonacci of index minus 2. And this is the static variable f. And then we are going to return f of index. So when we run it, we get exactly the same value. But the difference is that instead of calling the Fibonacci method for every value multiple times, we actually only call it for the methods a, uh, a linear number of times. Every Fibonacci function is called only once. Any questions? And you can actually implement uh, a counter to see how many times the Fibonacci function is actually called. This is stuff that usually is covered in CSC 214 because there you will learn about the asymptotic cost of function of uh, algorithms and you will learn the different notations and efficiency of algorithms. Mohammed, do you have a question? Meanwhile, we are going to implement a new class. We are going to pr call it print n times. So we said that we are also going to implement a recursive method. Print n times. And the message is message. And we want to print it 10 times. So now the public method print n times takes a string message and an integer n. If the integer n is greater than 0, we are going to print once let's print with new line um, or print n times the string uh, print once s for message and then call recursively print n times the message and minus one times. So it prints ten times message in this case. So Mohammed asked, can we use a helper method instead of storing dynamically storing arrays to implement Fibonacci problem? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, I mean the whole idea here is to cut to prune the number of times that we call the method Fibonacci. If we are going to call also a helper method that's an additional call, we actually want to minimize the number of frames on the execution stack. So um, I will think about it and I will come back to you. Maybe one of the TAs has a different idea, but I don't think that that is a good idea. At least I don't see it right now. Good. So now let's take a different problem. This problem is called the palindrome problem. And the palindrome problem is the how can we find uh, strings that if we read them from left to right and right to left, it's the same string. How do we check that the string is uh, a palindrome? So, in this case, is palindrome of a string S 
if the length of the string is less than or equal with 1, that means that if it's the empty string, no matter if you take it from left or from right, it's still the empty string, or if it's a letter, a single letter, reading it from left or from right is the same one letter. So the base case is that any empty string or string of one letter or one character is a palindrome. We return true. Otherwise, a string is a palindrome if the character at index 0, the first character, is equal with the last character. If it's not equal with the last character, if the first character and the last character are different, then we return false. It's not definitely not a palindrome. Otherwise, if we know that this condition is false, that means that the first character and the last character are the same, then we return is palindrome of the substring from position 1, that is the second character, up to the length of the array minus 1, not included. That is the last character, not included. So in the case of i, the substring will be just the, be the letter y. In the, race, in the case of race car, the substring from position 1 up to the last character not included is A, C, E, C, A. So what it, what it does, it says, if the, two, if the first character and the last character are the same, then check if it's a palindrome, the stuff inside. Eliminate the first character and the last character. So this is a good method. It basically takes a string and it creates new strings for the substrings inside the inner strings to find if the string is a palindrome. So let's actually implement it before we continue. So let's close all. We create a new class, palindrome. And we are going to invoke the method is palindrome. For race car. So now our method, written recursively, is a public static boolean method is palindrome, takes a string s as a parameter. If the length of the string s is less than equal with 1, then this is a palindrome. Else, we check if the first character is different than the last character if is different then is definitely not a palindrome because if you read it from left the first letter is different than if you read it from right else we call recursively is palindrome of s dot substring from position 1 to the last character which is s dot length minus 1 so now if we put a breakpoint at this instruction and we run it with the debugger we see that the first call is is palindrome race car if we go in s is race car now we can actually check is the length less than 1? No. Is the first character different than the last character? Is R different than R? No. Then call is palindrome of the substring from position 1 to the last character, which if you take a look here is A, C, E, C, A. We eliminated the first character and the last character. And the algorithm continues. Is the length of this string less than 1? No. Is the first character different than the last one? No, they are both A's. Then call is palindrome of the substring after eliminating the first and the last A. And the process continues 
it gets to one letter, which immediately returns true, which returns true, and finally we print true. So race car is a palindrome. Now, what is a problem that you see with this program? This program is correct, but it's not very efficient. Why do you think that it's not efficient? The function length, uh, substring eliminates the character at the uh, high or the, the last character, so it doesn't include it. We get the substring from position 1, not 0, to the length of the string minus 1, which doesn't include that character. You are very close, Jose. So you basically are right that every time we call the method is palindrome, we call it with a new string because we actually create a new string. Strings are immutable in Java. So we actually took the original string, we create a copy, we eliminate the first and the last character, and we call again. So let's say that our string has uh, 10 characters we create another string of 8 characters, then we create another string of 6 characters, and so on. This is time consuming and memory consuming, because we are creating new strings every time we invoke this method. So the, 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 the proposal that Kirk has is very good. Why don't we put the whole thing in a character array and keep the positions, the index of the first, the, the index of the low index and the high index and now we'll compare the characters at those indices and in the recursive method we just subtract uh, increment 1 the low index and subtract 1 from the high index. The moment that the two indexes meet we know that it's a palindrome. We don't create new strings every time. So that's exactly what we are going to do next. We are going to use a helper method. So, the is palindrome method is not efficient because it creates a new string for every recursive call. What we can do is our method is palindrome that takes a string could call an overloaded method is palindrome with the string s position 0 for low and the length of the string minus 1 for high. This is a new method, a new uh, method that has the same name, but has three parameters. The string s, low and high indices. If high is less than or equal with low, that basically means the two indices has, have met in the middle, then we can return true. That basically means that it's either that we, we saw all the prefix, all the suffix, they are identical in reverse order, and we met in the middle, is, this is a palindrome. Otherwise, if the character at index low is different than the character at index high, this is the same as before, the two corresponding characters are different, then we return false. Otherwise, we call is palindrome of s low plus 1 and high minus 1. So we basically have these two indices, one that comes from the beginning and one that comes from the end, and we compare corresponding characters to see if they are the same or not. So, let's return back to Java. We said that our method is palindrome. We'll just call a method is palindrome with three parameters, s, 0, and s.length minus 1. Then we define this helper method. that takes three parameters, a string, an integer low, and an integer high. If the integer high is less than equal with low, that means that it's either they landed on the same character or actually high became lower than the uh, index low, we return true. Otherwise, if the character at index low is different than the character at index high, then we return false. Otherwise, we call 
is palindrome for the same string s, but low is incremented with 1 and high is decremented with 1. So now the program is the same as before, the main method, and it only computes that is palindrome by create. We have a single string in the entire program, race car. That string, the reference to that string is passed to the method is palindrome, which passes to the method is palindrome with three parameters, which always passes the same string to the recursive invocations. So the helper method only helps us to make this method more efficient, less creation of objects. Any questions? Okay. okay, so before we continue with selection sort or more complex uh, problems, I'm going to save the current version, the current recording, so we don't lose it or we don't lose the voice like we did in the past. We are going to do the lab for today, then the homework, and then we are going to return back to finish the recursion chapter. So first we are going to 